Hello and welcome everyone to this CTO Craft Bites. Today we're enjoying a fireside chat with Fabio Oliveira, Managing Director of YLD. Um, and the topic's about balancing innovation and risk management. So apologies for the slight delay. Proudhask has uh, innovated and changed the way that we log in and uh, set things up. So we were dealing with that so right on topic. Anyway, if this is your first time at a CTO Craft Bytes event, let me tell you a little bit more about this group. Uh, CTO Craft is a mentoring and coaching community for technology leaders all around the world, focusing on supporting technologies and technologists rather in their leadership growth. Members are about over seven, no, 8,000. Every time I do one of these bites, it's gone up by 1,000, which is great. CTO Craft provides one-to-one -one coaching, mentoring groups, a curated Slack community, and events like this one. So if you're not a member then and you're interested in joining, then and I highly recommend it. Please do have a look at the website, uh, and we're going to post some links in the chat, which you should see. Um, so uh, looking forward to seeing you at more events. So special thanks to CTO Craft sponsors. Um, they help make these Bytes events possible. Partners like AWS, Google Cloud, O'Reilly, and Pentalog, among others. CTO Craft membership gives you access to some unique benefits from some of these partners. So please click on the link that you should see in the chat. I'm always slightly worried now, but these things are appearing in the chat. Great. Um, <clears throat> and thank you to YLD for sponsoring this particular event. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Dan Smith, executive coach. Uh, and I also run some of the coaching circles with CTO Craft and uh, advise on M&A with uh, uh, technical and product due diligence. Joining me is Fabio, patiently there. And uh, thanks for dealing with our issues, Fabio. He's managing director of, of YLD. Would you like to say a little bit about yourself? Of course, yeah. And um, first of all, thank you very much for CTO Craft for uh, having the event today inviting me to it. It's been a, a long time collaboration between YLD and, and CTO Craft. So once again, thank you all for having us and uh, it's a pleasure to support the community. Um, and, and yeah, technical issues before beforehand have been cleared. We're all good to go. Um, so uh, we will have plenty of interactive interactions during the this, this session today. So people feel free to, to, to share your thoughts on, on the chat and Q&A uh, area on the right. Uh, but before I get there, as Dan said, just doing an intro. Um, so I'm, I'm Fabio, Managing Director at YLD. I'm hailing from what is now today a, a sunny Lisbon in Portugal. Um, at YLD, we work with, with companies that uh, go through all market sectors, so from travel to retail to health to fintech, uh, and we help those companies uh, move forward with their tech. Uh, we analyze their problems and help them implement new solutions to, to issues that they might have. Um, a little bit on myself again, I'm a software engineer by trade. I've been in the, in the industry for 15 plus years uh, right now. Um, I've, I've worked across product companies, consulting or service companies um, until I got to YLD as a software engineer and over the years started to, to build up a little bit of my uh, repertoire and got to the role I am today, where I mostly work with some of our clients in their tech strategy um, and, and helping them succeed, succeed as, as uh, companies. Excellent, and welcome again. So before Very we much. start, as Fabio says, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So I'm sure you've all come here because you've got particular questions that you're facing that you would like answered. I uh, can't guarantee we'll answer all of them, but. It used to be down there, but I think now it's over there. There's a little question uh, button. It might be on the other side if I'm not mirrored. Um, and in there, you can enter a question and you can also at least used to be able to vote on other people's questions. So then the most popular ones would bubble up. So feel free to chat as well. But if it's a particular question, it's going to be easier for me to spot it in that uh, Q&A area. So please do get questions in there because we'd like to make sure we address the things that are really of interest to you. Right, take a breath. Whew. So it's all working. So tell us, it's all working. It's all what working. is the relation? Sorry? It's all working. It's all working. Everything well, is according to plan. We don't know, right? I mean, we could be here talking yes. to ourselves. So but this, I mean, maybe this is an example of risk and innovation, right? So tell, tell us a bit about this relationship between 
risk in innovation. I mean, if I keep innovating and I keep head of the market, it, where's the risk? Definitely, yeah. Uh, so, so before before I answer the question, I, I just want to say, and as uh, Dan said, um, feel free to ask questions, uh, but I'll, I'll just do a sort of um, warning to navigation today, as in um, today it's more about discussion and putting um, findings that me as an, as an individual, but also from our company side, um, that we've explored and we've experienced in, in, the, in the industry over the years. Uh, so I'm not here to be prescriptive, or if you feel like you're going to leave here today with a playbook on how to solve innovation within your companies, um, I hate to break it for you, but that's probably not what, what's going to happen. But what I bet is going to happen is that we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to expose a few topics. Some of those you might have gone through in, in your own organizations. Some of those might just be new or you might not even agree with those. And that's exactly why we want to keep this interactive. So let's, if, if at any time you have examples or you just want to bring something up, feel free to drop those in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and both Ben and I will keep an eye out for that. Uh, but again, today it's not about being prescriptive. It's just about having an open conversation about some challenges and some ways of overcoming those and even doing some um, in-depth analysis on a few bits and pieces. But, um, but yeah, that's just it. Just wanted to set up the stage um, to, to, to this. Um, but again, just, just going to your question then uh, about the relationship between risk and innovation. Um, I think we've all been there uh, in the tech world. Um, we want to do a replatforming exercise or we want to bring something new into our teams and we dive headfirst into it and with that we don't pay attention to things that actually then will have an impact in the success of what we end up implementing um, and that's the bit that sometimes misses in in making sure that these decisions are uh, around innovation are taken in a way that makes sense for the company. And, and I mean that in the, in the likes of uh, technology evolves so rapidly nowadays. It's a, it has always evolved rapidly, let's be honest, but more so nowadays. I was reading something the other day on, uh, it's obviously everyone's talking about it right now, AI, LLMs, open AI, and the likes of that. But someone was saying, I can't remember who, so this is definitely something to add later on or as a follow-up to this session. Uh, but someone was saying that um, they've always felt like there was going to be a breakthrough with AI. Obviously, like, there is science fiction written about it, but they didn't expect it to happen so early. And, uh, and, and that to me, it's very revealing of this exact motive of technology evolves so rapidly that sometimes we as leaders and our teams with us make decisions and don't take this into account. Again, I, I've said it, we've all experienced with the latest web tech that then got deprecated or didn't have a follow-up and we've invested massive amounts of time into that and it ended up getting nowhere. And I'm not saying that's wrong. What I'm saying is that there needs to be risk analysis to that. And unfortunately, most of us, um, to go through a series of processes where this isn't checked enough and then it doesn't feed into the decision process at the end of it and and, and again this seems like a very internally focused um, reason or um, uh, relationship between innovation and risk um, that is related to it but then there's other external factors like regulatory compliance um, the big scary monster GDPR or for our US based friends or people in the audience that have companies that operate in, operate in the US market, the CCPA, so the California Consumer Privacy uh, Act that have increased the, um, the, the, the need for companies to pay attention to how they use their uh, clients' data. And, and let's face it, like over time, there has been, again, massive and rapid changes in technology that led to companies having uh, to innovate and to have a head start in the market by not paying attention to this 
compliance, regulatory compliance. And now they face the risks of that. Again, with GDPR, the fees are insane. They are brutal. Mm -hmm. and they can really take a dent in a company. Um, but, but with that, there's also cultural resistance internal to the company where some people might just not see the appetite to, to innovate. And that's something that needs to be taken into account. And it needs to be taken into account in multiple forms, as in as a hurdle to the innovation, but then also as a, an impact in the people in, in the organization um, that leads to attrition, leads to um, divisions within the teams. And again, needs to be taken into account. And uh, by the way, I'm, I'm going through this and um, it might seem very high detail, but later on, I'll just like to have a few examples that just- Give us some juicy examples. Exactly, right? some juicy examples. Uh, and, and actually with the cultural resistance one, I think it brings up one of my favorite communication problems, which is the XY problem. Um, and, and for those, uh, I, most of you might, might have heard of it. Uh, those of you who haven't, XY problem, it's a very common communication problem where we have a problem which is X, and then we ask someone about how to solve for Y. Mm -hmm. uh, and why might not have a relationship with mm -hmm. solving X, but we do think that's the case. Uh, an example would be, um, I have a, a nail, I have a screwdriver. How do I hammer this nail with a screwdriver? And people might say, well, you get the handle and you knock it and then you'll nail the nail. But people get so focused on your question around the nail and the screwdriver that no one actually suggests using an hammer to it. Um, and again, cultural resistance brings a little bit of that. I'll, I'll give you a few examples or at least one example of having observed that and changes that came to solve it. And last but not least, limited resources. Let's face it, we all mm -hmm. go through that, either in terms of time, financial investment, or people. Um, it's, it's a risk that isn't accounted for. Some of us want to move things forward, but just get faced with limited resources. They just get We just get faced with not having the necessary tools to, to advance. And again, it doesn't take into account, like it's not taken into account in our risk analysis in the impact that what we want to do actually has on the business. Mm -hmm. Great. So risk of, of failing to, to innovate, which I guess is also failing to adapt. I mean, it's clear things like regulatory compliance, if you're a bank and new laws come in or uh, you, that could, I mean, literally put you out of business, lock you out of the market and GDPR you mentioned. Is there a risk of innovating too much as well? I mean, what, what, does, what does a balance look like between innovation and risk? Again, I'll, I'll bring up the best example I can think of as of right now and that people are aware of. And, and again, I'll, I'll have to pull AI out of my pocket and use it as an example. Um, I don't know uh, if, if anyone uh, has seen some of the news coming out a few weeks, probably a month or so ago, about this memorandum from top AI scientists mm -hmm. um, that asked for a pause in the research of AI models over the next, I, I can't remember if it was six months or 12 months, but uh, like it wasn't a, yeah, a, it was a that big of a time span. And I think that's a very good example because from a socially, possibly from a socially responsible point of view, that makes perfect sense. Let's make sure that regulatory and uh, regulatory compliance and um, ethical needs are met before we get to a point where there's no return from it. But mm -hmm. one thing that comes with that is it's all fine for the good actors in the field. That would work for OpenAI. That would work for Facebook. That would work for Stanford University or Berkeley. They are making massive uh, progress in, in AI and LLMs. It probably wouldn't work for malicious actors. Not probably. Mm -hmm. Like a rogue government wouldn't take heed of this and they would just keep on innovating. And then we get to a point where by actually innovating too much, as you're saying, um, we risk so, so much in not just keeping innovating. And uh, again, I, I find that as a, as a, um, a good example. Again, and, and happy to, to anyone that is interested 
in talking about it uh, afterwards and exploring that because I, I find this part of this current scenario around AI and the more so the implications it might have not in society as large, but in, in, in this bits and pieces more interesting than just uh, going and running a few queries on ChatGPT or GPT-4 models. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Great. Um, so just a reminder to the audience, please do enter your questions, or maybe you've got some examples as well. Please do share those in the chat. Slightly concerned about not seeing any chat or any questions, but they are there. Are, they are there uh, then. They're all, they're maybe that we've answered them all already. Can we get like a message on the chat? Just to, to make sure like the first person to get a message on the chat gets a shout out from both Dan and I. Gregory, yeah. thank you. There you go. Uh, there we go. There, there, there. There. Welcome, thank you, Gregory. Gregory. And everyone else, of course. All right, yeah, excellent. Awesome. So at least one person's paying attention. All right, so this, I mean, it sounds great in theory, right? Balancing the, the risk, the innovation. What does it look like in practice? How do you implement this? Yeah, so it's interesting. I'll, I'll just go and, and so I'll just get the headline out. Like uh, most important thing, and I, I mentioned it before in those examples, is having a, a way to analyze risk. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is making sure that where we're working on, or, or better, like the, the company we are at and where we're leading this is able to foster a culture of innovation. That's the single most important bit in all of this conversation today. And, and I'll give just an example. I'll, I'll, try to dissect, like, I'll, I'll try to take all of this apart and go from where most of us probably find ourselves or try to identify some pitfalls that we see our teams going to, and then just offer a few pillars that people need to observe to make sure that that culture is there. But before I do that, I'll do, I was reading something not in preparation for this, but just uh, uh, reading over the last few weeks, uh, I read this, uh, an article, uh, actually from a consultancy company um, that I won't name because they don't sponsor CTO Craft, so they don't get the, the shout out. Okay. Um, but, uh, it, it was a very good article about, um, about innovation and cultures of innovation. And they started by, uh, and, and it catch my eye because they started with a very good example. And it has nothing to do with tech. Uh, and it might even seem, seem weird. So they started by naming this person, uh, a chap called Alex Honnold. Um, again, some of you might know him, uh, the ones that don't. Alex is, is known as the first human being to free solo El Capitan, not the Mac OS uh, uh, version, uh, but this massive granite wall, 3,000 feet tall, in Yosemite Park in California. And free soloing means he climbed that, a vertical wall, without any sort of support. No ropes, no safety nets, just him, his chalk bag, and the wall. There's nothing else. There's actually a very good um, documentary by National Geographic. I'll recommend it. Uh, if you have vertigo or you're afraid of heights, you'll be just like myself. Your hands will start sweating as they are right now. Uh, but the most important part of it is doctors um, analyzed Alex for what he does. And they run a number of uh, um, exams, one of those an MRI, and they found out there is amygdala, uh, which is the fear center of the brain. It's really small. So he has, he's not afraid of climbing. Is not afraid of what us normal humans are afraid of. And again, I said it, it was going to be weird starting with this example, but I did it because everyone has fear. And that's one of the, like, just that explains why we need to have risk analysis around innovation. Because at the bottom of it, like at the gist of it, the root of all of this is fear. And I, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm an authority. This, uh, I'll just go back and contextualize. This is pure observation of different examples um, and also reading a lot about it. But first and foremost, and in no special, like in no special order, but innovation doesn't happen at companies. 
because people have a fear of the impact that's going to have in their careers. And so they settle. They don't act. They don't act out of fear of being out of a job, of not getting that bonus, of not getting that compensation raise. And they do nothing. And again, I'll get to the unifying piece at the end, but a company where people live in fear of not innovating because they feel like they can't challenge the status quo because that will bring an impact in their career is not at a head start to be able to bring innovation into the fold and be able to innovate clearly. And next, and this speaks more to um, possibly people in the room today, um, it's the fear of loss of control. And it, this brings up a rather interesting um, psychological effect called the ambiguity effect, where we avoid certain options. We avoid taking certain options because we don't, we, we aren't sure about the outcomes. And innovation is all about that. It's about us doing something that is going to bring something like that is going to bring a result to our to, to what we're doing to our company to our teams and we can't really control the the, the results or the effectiveness effectiveness of the results so naturally as leaders we have that fear of losing control and what I, when it ends up happening is that we seek control over incrementally over incremental changes rather than through true innovation and what that does is that lessens experimentation in our teams that lessens risk taking because we are so focused on not losing control and on not letting go um, that we end up passing that to people that work with us and last but not less important, I would actually say it's the most important one, is fear of criticism. Is sitting in front of others and proposing something and fearing that that is going to be judged. It doesn't make sense because it might even break the status quo. And what ends up happening is that people conform to a model and going with the status quo, not bringing apart from that mold, leads to, again, no experimentation no innovation, not moving forward, and just getting stuck. Um, so, as I said, like this is just observation of a few examples of where fear plays a part in not bringing innovation to companies, in not bringing innovation to, to, to teams. And as I said, us as leaders need to be able to solve this, both with our teams in terms of fear of uh, criticism, fear of... Um, uh, of uh, loss of control, of confidence. Um, but for ourselves, again, as fear of loss of control, we need to work on that. And again, I said I was not going to be prescriptive, but I'm actually now going to say like five pillars that can help with that. Uh, and again, uh, it feels like Ben and I are always hammering at this, but like if there's any questions or if anyone disagrees with something, feel free uh, either on the left or right to, to, to share your thoughts. But there's five things that help with that, helps us approach how to solve some of these fears and creating an alignment and uh, a general alignment between people uh, in our organizations, in our, in our companies, and the need to innovate and the result of innovation. And at, at the top, and I'm not going to, uh, this is the one I'm not going to spend much time on. It's just innovation needs to be a key value for the company. And I'm not going to spend too much time on it because um, it has been spoken about in the industry and at CTO Craft in other events. I don't think we need to spend lots of time talking about it. Like companies that have innovation or speak about innovation in their core values start in the pole position to, to bring innovation to, to what they do. The other bit is framing. And that's for us as leaders. It's how we frame innovation in the grand context, like in the big context of what we do. And that's bringing optimism. That's bringing positivity into it. That's making sure that when we talk about innovation, 
we look at it from a positive point of view, from a positive mindset. It's kind of like the, uh, uh, possibly most of you have heard about that, that saying of, you only miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Uh, something like that. Is it by Wayne Gretzky or by Michael Scott from The Office? I can never tell, um, but but it's it's from one of those. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's actually that is how you frame trying. Like you need to take the shot because if you don't take the shot, you definitely miss it. You don't even miss it. Like you didn't take it. It's not there. Um, then the other two kind of come hand in hand, and that's how to be able to signal, but also also how to be able to show that this is important. And again. This is all from the mindset of a leader. And it's on how we show to others in the organization that we are on board with this. We are not shying away in a corner. We are not asking people to come forward while we stay in the back. We are there and we understand the importance of, of, of innovation to what we do and to our team. So we show up, we signal that, we show that it's that, that that is the most important thing, thing we can be doing or one of the most important things we can be doing, that we dedicate time, our own time, to make sure that people understand that and that we are there. And again, to go back to the beginning and when I spoke about fear, something that sometimes doesn't get seen and that's to shield people. People need to be... To, to feel safe. They need to feel like they are safe from the criticism, from losing their jobs, from being demoted or not being promoted, from losing control over their teams. And once more, as a leader, this is one of the aspects where we need to show up and, 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 and get in front of people and, and help them with that. So, I mean, I'm sitting here slightly smiling because I'm thinking, well, how, how many CTOs in our audience here are, are wishing that their CEO was less innovative and a bit more aware of the risks? So in, in that kind of situation, I, mean, I, I think probably most of us know this kind of CEO who always has the new idea and it changes every five minutes. What's the way to kind of manage that kind of situation? Do you have any tips on that? I might be repeating myself, but it's all about framing. It's understanding what does that bring? So I was having this chat the other day, and again, I'll repeat myself on this at least. Some of the examples I've been using are public knowledge. Uh, we might have heard about them. We might not have heard about them, but they are out there. Some others are from personal experience, and I'll do my best to, so that if anyone is hearing this afterwards or if they are in the audience, they don't feel like, is he talking about X? <laughs> um, so I'll do my best. But um, I, I was speaking with, with someone I know the, the other day that runs a company um, and this kind of scenario happened. But the funny thing is it was reversed. It's more of a CEO, CEO wants to do something that it clearly feels like something that needs to be done. Um, tech part of the business, it's focused on making sure that other stuff are more priority and how do you balance that? And to me, it all comes down to, can we show the results? Like what are the effective results of implementing this? And I guess this is where what I said before becomes true of, I don't think there's a right answer to it because let's face it, we, if, if this is a, a FTSE 250 company, the approach to it will be completely different from a company that it's now seeking their Series A. It's all down to the context. But as a North, as a North Star, as a guiding star, I guess that, or what I feel is that um, having that understanding of what is the impact in the business, in the team, should be at the forefront. That, like that should be the, there's a KPI, if there's, anything to decide, anything to look at, it's that. Like, what's the impact in, in the company? What's impacting our team? Is that going to, again, if it's a, a FTSE 250 company, is that going to increase our top line? Is that going to optimize our bottom line? If it's a Series A, com a company seeking a Series A next few months, is this going to allow us to raise money? Or is this going to make it impossible for us to raise money because we are losing focus? Um, if, if I had to implement an exercise, that would be it. 
analyze the results and make a decision on it, which again goes back to risk analysis, risk mitigation, etc. Mm -hmm. So talking about risk analysis and, and risk management, uh, a lot of our uh, members in CTO Craft are startup scale-ups, relatively early stage. And typically, if I'm doing due diligence on a company, I'm, I will only see formal risk management if they've got to something like ISO 27001 or some much more uh, mature kind of framework. What, when do you think it's right to start having some kind of formal risk management and what might it look like as a first step? Um, so it's a very good question. And I, I think you, you gave a few examples of ISO 27001. Um, Some of that can be more externally imposed, right? So I'm yeah, thinking, correct. if and that's coming gonna, from, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, I think there's a point in time where, as a company serving consumers, there's mm -hmm. two things. Obviously, and I we already spoke about it. There's regulatory compliance, where if you're dealing with large uh, with a large number of user data, you need to do it. Um, if you want to engage with certain organizations, you need to ensure that you do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I get your question, and it's like, should it start earlier? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want this to sound like my typical answer <laughs> today, but it, it depends. Like, it depends on what is the level of investment we're talking about here. Because if you remember, one of the bits I said early on is limited resources. Mm -hmm. And generally, these more formal risk compliance measures come with lots of investment attached to it, both in terms of um, financial investment, uh, effort, time that takes away from people and stops people doing innovation, proper innovation, tech innovation, mm -hmm. to focus around compliance. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a time and a place to that. Um, it's just that most companies, I, I was trying to think, while saying this, I was trying to think of examples that I know of where that might have started early on. Uh, mm -hmm. And I can't really think of any. I actually can think of a few that started later than what they should. Um, and I think that's, that's the real issue from, a, mm -hmm. from an industry perspective, but from an ethical perspective as well. Um, if we're talking about user data, et cetera. Um, but, but again, I think it's, um, it, it's never late to do that. Um, it might be a bit too early, depending on on the level of commitment we have and the the ideas that we have. Um, but, but yeah, yeah. And what what kind of um, solutions do you recommend to, to to customers then? If if they you know if you identify and they agree that there's a need for some kind of risk management, do you have some kind of I don't know, maybe a portfolio of solutions, or is it let's just have a chat and create an Excel spreadsheet, or how, how might it look? Who told you that I'm the Excel the spreadsheet expert in the in the company? With macros. I bet I bet you got briefed on that by someone. So I'll I'll have a talk yeah, with, with my, my yeah. team. Now I'll, I'll have a talk with my team about it. Um, it's um, it, it's interesting. I, I was thinking of you a few examples and some that we went through. Um, and, and I'll actually use one of those, one of those now, because um, it, it illustrates quite well um, the answer or a possible answer to, to your question. Um, a, we, ha we had this engagement with a company um, where I'm, I'm trying not to make it too too obvious. I, I don't think it will be obvious. Uh, they developed uh, mobile apps, um, wanted to go through their backlog of work, and for that, they, they not only uh, developed mobile apps, but also web apps. So they had a team that did web technologies, then the React a native mobile team. And they've asked us, can we accelerate that? Because we have a backlog of things that we need to do on mobile. We're looking at things like React Native. Mm -hmm. Can you guys come on board and help us divide a, devise a plan that will um, actually uh, help us move faster. And so we came on board and it feels like a fairly simple solution. Like the, the type of applications that they were doing wouldn't suffer from moving to 
in this case, the React Natives. Uh, they had a React team on board already. The native development team would continue working on what, what I would call like the backbone of the apps and everything new that had to do with looks and feels and transitions and screens could be done in React with the help of the React team. More so uh, something that sometimes goes untold or goes, uh, it's not talked about, which is talent. Some mm -hmm. of these changes might be better because there's more talent in certain areas than others. Like actually this, the, the region where this company operated on had a very good um, React talent pool whilst the mobile native mobile uh, uh, one wasn't that um hadn't grown that much so it was really hard for them to bring more people doing native development than it would be for them to bring people with react experience so we analyzed everything and we we're like okay so this is the plan we can work with you on building a proof of concept that shows that we can start building this and deliver it um in technologies that you feel are gonna have an impact uh, in the future, not just in the way you hire, but in the way you work and in the way you develop the apps in terms of look and feel, et cetera. Um, and it, up until now, it seems like, um, it, it feels like um, there's a, a nice story here where we came on board, we recommended something that seems obvious, and this company started doing things as we said. But what's the reality is that once we started developing that, that proof of concept, we understood that things just weren't there. And again, it feels like it was the X, X Y problem again mm -hmm. of wanting to do something and asking for something that it's a little bit related, probably use the same words, but it doesn't really solve X. So we went back on the drawing board and what we devised was a plan for them to actually kind of clean, I'm just gonna keep it simple here, but kind of clean their processes around native development and make it more effective so that their backlog would be sorted out. Um, and again, what seemed like a massive innovation and change for the company ended up actually being in, in, uh, bringing innovation to, to, to their development, but in a completely different way. Um, in a way that actually helped them go through a backlog of clients that they had to serve to change some of their processes within the teams that they already had, and they didn't need mm -hmm. to separate them or create like weird divisions or weird shaped teams that would cross boundaries. Um, so that's the kind of work that we do. It's, it's analyzing the environment, coming in, looking at things, um, it's interesting because uh, we have, I, I usually said that we have this internal motto uh, or mantra that goes like strong opinions weekly held, but it's no longer internal because we published a blog post about it a few a few months back. So right. and it's even hours, like we appropriated it from, from the industry. But we would say this, like we say this all the time when we engage with new clients is we know how things are done, but there, if there's one thing is in terms of business and business cases, our clients know their business so much better than we do. And what that means is um, we are in there to help clients with technology and jump over these technology hurdles, help answer um, uh, questions. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and like, and that's usually how, how we help it. Uh, but also from an individual perspective and kind of, putting wildly as a company to decide. So like, we don't need to be focusing solely on that, but as an individual, um, it's understanding where others are and understanding the context and offering a solution that, again, with everything, with, all, with, with our knowledge base, personal knowledge base, makes sense in that. And then iterating over it because we go on in the, especially in the engineering space, well, in the tech space about agile methodologies and how to iterate over problems. And then we forgot to do it in the, the, these processes that are more company wide. And it feels like it, it gets stuck there in a corner for the tech teams to work on it. But then the whole organization forgets about that, forgets about experimentation, about cycling through different hypotheses and testing them and seeing what works best. Yeah. Great.
Uh, so we've got some some questions come in. Thanks, Sam, for validating our QA um, mm -hmm. function work. So uh, let, let's take the one there. And, and uh, for those watching, you can vote on these um, as well to make them come up the list a little bit. But uh, Sam asks, what, what is a typical event that makes small startup companies create a, a risk management strategy? What is a typical event that makes small startup companies create a risk management strategy? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I actually think, and if Sam, if I can put this question uh, of yours and then the other one about um, how to prove to others that your app is secure, uh, I, I might have read that wrong at first, but, uh, but I'll get to it. So what is a typical event um, that allows you to create a risk management strategy. In reality, that risk management strategy is a living document. It's not something that you do once and you put it in a, a, a drawer somewhere and don't look at it. So it doesn't need to start big. It doesn't need to be the biggest thing you have in your, in your company. It can start small. And it doesn't need to be something too complex. Like if you're a small company, uh, and this is where uh, I think it kind of goes hand in hand with what's after, but uh, again, as Dan said, it does this kind of work of DD with some companies around some of these certifications, so you can add a little bit more to it. But we can't forget about the fact that some security considerations can be seen as starting a risk management st strategy. Like it might seem obvious, but how do you treat your user data? How do you secure your user data? And we might think that this is not part of this strategy, but this is like the backbone of it. And then things just add on top of that as your organization as your startup starts to grow and has a bigger a, a bigger reach into the market has more customers has more interactions with, with others um so i would say that the event it's actually the start of the platform because again it, it's there it's at the start you're creating a platform you have users you're building up something that allows users to log in you need to think about how secure that is. How do you do that? What is the strategy? Do you use, do you use passwords? Or do you innovate and use, um, what is it called now? Passkeys, that web out and standard that is being rolled out by Apple, Google, I think one password as well. Like it's this sort of questions that you start asking early on, and then you build up on that. As in relation to ISO and SOC 2 certification, SOC 2 certification, sorry. Um, Again, those are just external audits that prove to third parties that you have gone through that, through a standard that others adhere to. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't prove to others that your app isn't secure. You can. It's just that those others will have to believe you. Um, and then there's obviously a, a sort of web of trust in play there. But all those certifications do is create a standard that people look into. And if you are clear with that standard, then it's fine. Uh, but again, Dan can probably complement uh, on this bit uh, around the, the certifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess the, the uh, I'm, I'm probably going to borrow yours now. It depends, right? I mean, it, on what, what your your product does, assuming your product company, but you know, if you're B2C and you're capturing information, personal information, I don't know, something like a dating site, I mean, you might have sexual orientation and highly personal information, then you might take a lot uh, more consideration of the data security earlier on rather than if it's, I don't know, a newspaper or, you know, something that's sharing uh, readily available information. Um, I think the the value of an ISO and a SOC certification is to prove that you have a kind of baseline of security, um, and it to me it doesn't prove that your app is secure. Right? I've seen plenty of companies that have a certification, uh, and it says the policies all look great, but actually how they're implemented might not be that um, what's the word watertight. Um, 
but it, it, what it does is gives a level of confidence that your application has been tested by a third party uh, and that you know they, they there are fewer questions to ask um, what it does is potentially cuts down lots of vendor um, requests for uh, like a, a big questionnaire because a lot of those will be covered by the the, the SOC certification but uh, I mean there's no reason why you can't answer a, a vendor due diligence questionnaire and then get approved it's just if you have to do it lots of times it's going to take a lot of your resources true and, and I think it, it actually comes with something else and you just mentioned that uh, then which is it isn't a proof that the application or the platform is secure and again from from experience and as while being a services company sometimes when we engage with clients we get asked where's your iso or your SOC certification we're like well we are a service company we are not offering any sort of platform data processing etc so it doesn't really apply to us we can go through a security due diligence and show you how we do x y and z and what I'm getting to with this is these certifications sometimes do hide real problems because they feel like just a stamp that you put on something and it's like you don't need to check anything else. So it kind of goes with the flow. And the level of issues, as, as Dan was saying, in terms of things not being watertight, that I, I've seen in the past where platforms were watertight by ISO or SOC standards. There were actually issues with it. And those went unseen because there was a stem saying everything was fine. So I guess what I'm trying to say is from the other perspective, if anyone gets faced with a provider that actually says that they are ISO or SOC certificated or that they have gone through this, I'm not going to say take it with a grain of salt, but do your, even if it's like a low effort or low level uh, or high level, actually, a due diligence to understand what the actual practices are. You wouldn't lose anything from it. You'd only benefit. And worst case scenario, just building some report with their security team to, to, to get a better view in the future. So uh, I just wanted to add that because sometimes they get hailed as a, a solution to everything or the best thing that could ever have ever happened. And so much more goes unseen. Yeah. And I guess what what often gets missed off in my experience of these kind of risk management assessments is the the people risk. Um, and also it's probably the hardest to to mitigate, but you you typically have people with administrative access uh, or access to the build pipeline so I've, i was working recently with a company that install um sorry that scan networks so they have access to to networks um to gather the data and i mean we've probably all heard of the solar winds hack in 2020 2020 was it or early 2021 but this kind of injection of of um code this kind of thing um it involves people usually leaving something open so this is the kind of a real risk and i guess that's you want the people to innovate but <laughs> you also have to balance that with giving them too much uh un, kind of unmitigated power can also be be very risky true that's true that's definitely true all right so oh another question dennis uh, okay, so what's your suggestions to start initiatives in a traditional higher education institute to bring in innovation? Uh -huh. a tricky question. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it seems like a tricky question, but um, it actually plays close to home because uh, for, for many reasons. <laughs> um, one of, and again, um, Dennis, um, what I'm about to say, it's my personal experience. It might not seem like being help, but uh, one of my first jobs was actually working in a, a higher uh, in an university um, in a research center in a university, um, and and I had the the chance to again work in that research center that actually had funding to it and could innovate and could experiment with it. So 
I guess that's just my first bit is just making sure that there's enough financing in that institution to, to be able to take things forward. Because I think, unfortunately, we all know how academia works, how universities, higher education institutions work. And <clears throat> from grants to investment, unfortunately, that plays a big part. So if that investment isn't there and the mentality for investment isn't there, it's going to be very hard, very hard. The other thing is actually my, my wife works in a higher education institution. So it, it's something that I see not, not every day. Um, and again, she's not in the tech space, but um, it's, it's hard. It's hard to innovate, not just in tech, but in, in across the field, across different fields. Um, and it all boils down to the same question, investment. But once investment is there, or if you can prove that investment is needed to, it's kind of like a, what I'd call a, a a bigger company, like a blue chip company. It's like if you can if you can show that there is a definitive improvement on the on the top line, and the top line in, probably in, in an institution like this is attracting more students, attracting more grants, making sure that that's going to have an impact. I think you've done half of the job. Um, so it all comes down from planning and from being able to show, um, as Dan asked me before, one of his questions, like, how do you show this? Like, how do you show um, to a CEO that this is a good thing to innovate on or not? And I gave him the other example. And this is a similar example. Is like, how do you as a leader go on and show that doing this, although it's going to need this sort of funding, it's actually going to track this level of results. Because in the end, it's all about that, whether we like it or not. It's all about doing something innovative to bring results. Those results can take many forms. More often than not, um, they, they are financial results, but they can be people-led results. Uh, it can be to attract more people. Like, uh, again, at YLD, we've always had open source at the, at the core of what we do. So every time we have an opportunity, open source is there, and that allows us to bring others on board that share the same passion with open source development. So that's something that we innovate, and I'm putting it in quotes because it's not really innovation, but I, I, get, I, I think you get the point of how to attract more, how to impact the, the, the results of the company. Um, so then it's, again, to summarize, I think it's showing that what you're trying to do um, will lead to results. Um, is that easy to do? Probably not. Uh, but again, um, feel free to connect afterwards. As I said, um, there is there is personally there is a little bit of experience in that field, and I would be more than happy to to have a conversation about it and just um, discuss a little bit. I think it, that that's better than just kind of speaking out to 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 the audience here. We can have a, a little bit more personalized conversation afterwards. So do reach out afterwards. And I guess it's interesting as you say that sort of when you, when I hear innovation, I guess it, even I think actually well, that means using technology. Um, but as as we've already discussed, you can innovate process level, you can innovate at the culture yeah. level, um, and it doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't have to even involve technology, right? So I mean, higher education. There's all of these platforms that have appeared in the years where you see universities running courses on Coursera or whatever. Um, but actually, there might be much more mundane ways to innovate that don't involve technology, right? I mean, maybe yeah. YLD wouldn't be involved, but, <laughs> but oh, no, it, no, it's, it's, it's amazing the, yeah. the kind of range of things and don't kind of get hung up that it has to involve technology. 100%. I think this, like, especially in this case with Dennis, it goes way beyond technology um, because it does, as you said, Dan, it doesn't need to involve technology. As, I, as I've mentioned, um, um, some of the discussions here at home have nothing to do with technology and just have to do with how can that institution help their students? How can it attract more? How can it enable students to grow in their own institution or to have access to opportunities in their own institution? And again, that, that doesn't come with tech. That just comes with things like inclusion, making sure that um, uh, people are being heard and they are being taken into account. And again, that, that's that's innovation. We're obviously talking about here to a forum of CTOs, of, of executives in, in, in or tech leaders. Um, 
but but it goes beyond that. Like I think everything we spoke about here today applies to innovation throughout. All right. So looking at the clock, the the hours whiz by. So thank you very much, Fabio, for for sharing your insights. I don't know if there's any kind of last few words to wrap up, sum up what we what we said. Um, yeah. So, so so as I said, <clears throat> I think we as leaders do again now in the technology space, but we as leaders um, are responsible for obviously our own departments, our own companies, but also for the people that work with us. And one thing that we can't forget about is whatever we do and how we look at strategy, at strategies for innovation will affect the growth of our people and their careers. And I think that's one of the first things we need to have in mind is how the decisions that we make will influence the, the, the and will have an impact in the careers of others. And that's why I focused on the different fears that people have and how us as leaders can try to solve that by looking at those five pillars. Um, so all in all, it's just that. Um, and, and as I said before, um, as I said before, feel free to reach out to me uh, afterwards. Those of you um, that, that have participated, Sam, Dennis, uh, but even others in the audience that might not feel like this is the appropriate uh, forum, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn by, by email. Um, and yeah, it was lovely being here today and having the, the opportunity to, to, to share this with, with all of you. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you for asking the questions. Um, the links for contact details for Fabio and, and me should appear in the, in the chat very shortly. Um, otherwise, wishing you a great rest of the week and looking forward to seeing you at the next uh, CTO Crowd.